It was late afternoon, and the sun was shining through the window into our living room. I was holding my phone in my hand, still reading the last text message my wife had sent me. It was clearly meant for someone else, someone she referred to as Jay. There were no other messages from this person, so it must have been sent to me by accident. The clock on the wall was ticking. I'm going to be home late tonight. Don't stay up. That's what she said to me this morning at breakfast. She kissed me on the cheek. Her lipstick was immaculate, just like it always was. How many late nights has she had? The sun is setting. I'm looking at the shadow of a tree moving across the floor. I'm trying to make sense of what's happening, but it's difficult. You can't analyze emotions the same way you analyze engineering problems. I hear the lock clicking in the door. Ethan? Why are you sitting in the dark? I hear Rachel's voice call from the front door. Then her purse drops onto the console table. I cleared my throat. Nothing. She flicked on the light, and I saw it was Rachel. Or at least, it was someone who looked exactly like her. You'll hurt your eyes, reading in the dark, she says, heading into the kitchen. Did you eat? Who's Jay? I heard her footsteps stop, and she drew in a sharp breath. Huh? I showed her the message on my phone. You sent this to me by mistake, I explained. She looked confused, surprised, scared, and calculating all at once. Finally, she settled on confused. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't. It's the hardest I've ever spoken to my wife. Let's not kid ourselves. She backed away, putting a hand on the wall to steady herself. I can explain, she said. Jason? I study her expression. Or James? John? I try them out, one by one, like shots fired in the dark. Jason? she says, and hearing it spoken aloud is somehow even worse. From your work, my head spins. Jason, the co-worker who had been at our Christmas party, the one who had said how lucky I was. For how long? She hugged herself, a habit I usually found cute, but now it seemed like bad acting. Three months, I chuckled. Three months, 92 days of deceit. It's not that simple. Actually, it is. I start to rise. My legs feel surprisingly strong. Cheating is binary, Rachel. You either do it or you don't. It's the one thing that shouldn't require a patch. Don't do that, she says, her voice rising. Don't turn this into one of your systems analyses. We're not machines, Ethan. Life is messy and complicated and... And what? Necessary? I walk towards the window. I need some distance. Was I too predictable? Too boring? Did my emotional subroutines need updating? Stop it. You're acting like a fucking robot. She's crying now, her mascara running, but I just find myself staring at her, wondering if it's all part of the simulation. You want to know why? It's because Jason actually sees me. When's the last time you looked up from your projects long enough to notice that I was drowning? I try not to let the accusation sway me. This is my fault. No, but... Did you ever consider saying something? Letting me know you weren't happy? Would you have listened... I don't want to think about what he means by this, so I don't answer. Instead, I look out the window at the neighbor walking his dog with his wife. They smile and wave, completely unaware of the chaos going on next door. I have one question, I say, keeping my eyes on the neighbors. The dinner party we had last month, with Jason and his wife, was that before or after? She doesn't answer. Right. I turn to look at her. So, I'd shared wine with the guy who was plowing my wife cracked jokes, asked him how his kids were doing. Ethan, don't... I need to go. I can feel the room shrinking, the pictures on the walls suffocating me. I just... I need to think. Ethan, where are you going? I picked up my keys and left. I didn't even bother to respond. The cool, fresh air of the spring evening hit me as I stepped outside. I got into my car and looked back to see Rachel standing at the door. She looked so small standing there. I almost felt sorry for her, but then I thought about the fact that I'd have to see Jason at work tomorrow, and how he'd been smiling in my face for the last three months, shaking my hand every day while he was fucking my wife. I pulled out of the driveway, not sure where I was going to go, but knowing that I needed to get away. At least until the sun went down. I drove around for hours, going nowhere in particular, just driving aimlessly. I stopped at a few gas stations and convenience stores, but mostly I just drove. Eventually, I got tired and started heading back home. I got home at 4.37 a.m. It was still dark outside. I had been driving around most of the night, thinking about what had happened, trying to make sense of it. 
I unlocked the front door and went inside. Everything looked the same as it always did, except now I knew it wasn't. I took off my shoes and put them in the shoe rack next to Rachel's. Then I went into the kitchen and started making breakfast. I brewed a pot of coffee using the same amount of coffee grounds I always did. I tried to act normal, but it was hard. I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that Rachel wasn't Rachel. After a while, I heard her coming down the stairs. She hesitated for a moment before entering the kitchen, then smiled at me. You came back, she says. I live here. The words feel flat, two-dimensional. She poured herself a cup of coffee and walked by me to grab a mug. I smelled her shampoo and wondered if Jason knew what it smelled like. We need to talk, she says. Coffee? Before your morning meeting or after? She grimaced. Ethan, you're late for work. I point to the microwave clock, the most accurate clock in the house. I could call in sick. We need to go to work, Rachel, I say, buttering toast that I won't eat. We don't want anyone to get suspicious. She reaches for me but stops herself. Tonight, she says. We'll talk tonight. I nodded my understanding, not trusting myself to speak. She gathered her things and went to the door. Before leaving, she paused and came back to kiss me on the cheek. It felt like a slap in the face. When she was gone, I sat down at the dining room table and tried to think. It was strange. Everything felt different now, like I was in someone else's house, or maybe a stage production of someone else's life. Rachel's laptop was sitting on the counter, so I went over and opened it up. We both knew each other's passwords, since we had nothing to hide from one another. I typed in I-L-O-V-E-Y-O-U-E-T-H-A-N, and the screen came to life. I opened up her email and started going through it. It felt wrong, but I had to know what was going on. I had to know who the hell this J was. At first it was nothing, just mundane emails and calendar invites. But then I started to find them, emails and messages between her and that bastard Jason. But that wasn't all. There were messages from someone else, too. Someone named Steve. Miss you. Had a lot of fun last night. See you again soon. S. As I keep looking at the messages, I realize it's a lot worse than I thought. It wasn't just Jason. It was Steve, too. And it had been going on for months. I even found pictures of them together. And messages about when to meet up, pretending to be going to the gym, or out for groceries. I look out the window and see Steve's house across the street. I can't believe this. Just yesterday he was on my lawn, talking to me about the upcoming holiday. Just as I was about to put the phone down, a new email came in. I've been thinking about our Tuesday meeting. No meeting tomorrow, but how about our usual time? J. Tuesday. The same day I had been sitting at my computer, working late. I had been planning to take Rachel out to dinner at her favorite restaurant. I could still taste the coffee I'd been drinking. I closed the laptop calmly although I wanted to throw it out the window. The grandfather clock in the hallway was still ticking away, as if to remind me that time was still passing, even if it felt like it had stopped. I could hear the sound of a lawnmower starting up in the distance, and I knew it was Steve mowing his lawn on a Saturday morning. My phone buzzed in my pocket, and I pulled it out to see a text message from my boss. Where are you? We have a meeting in 15 minutes. I should respond, I thought. I should go to work. I should sit across from Jason at the conference table and pretend like everything was normal. I should pretend like I didn't just find out that my wife was cheating on me with my best friend. Instead, I walked over to the window and looked out at Steve, who was pushing the lawnmower back and forth across his yard. He looked so normal, so ordinary, just like he always did. I wondered if he knew that his wife was cheating on him too, or if he was just as clueless as I had been. I looked over at the picture of Rachel and me on our wedding day, hanging on the wall. We looked so happy, so in love. I wondered if she had ever really loved me, or if it had all been a lie. My phone buzzed again, and I ignored it. I didn't want to talk to anyone right now. I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to face the reality of what I had just discovered. I just wanted to sit here and try to make sense of it all. I took a deep breath and tried to calm myself down. I knew I needed to figure out what to do next, but I didn't know where to start. All I knew was that my life would never be the same again. I spent the rest of the morning in a daze, trying to come to terms with what I had just learned. I ignored my phone and all of the messages that were coming in. I didn't want to deal with any of it right now. I just wanted to be alone with my thoughts. Eventually, 
I made my way to my home office, where I tried to distract myself with work. But it was no use. My mind kept drifting back to Rachel and Jason, and to the email I had just read. I was tempted to call Cheryl immediately and tell her everything, but I knew I needed to verify the claims first. I didn't want to jump to conclusions without solid evidence. After a moment of contemplation, I decided to make sure the information in the email was correct before I called Cheryl. Babe? Rachel calls out from the main floor. I'm going to the store. Do you want anything? No, I respond, calm, as if I were talking about the weather. A few moments later, I heard her car starting up. Checking the time, I saw it was 2.17 p.m. She was leaving at her usual time for shopping, or whatever it was she was up to. I opened up the command prompt and began to type on my keyboard. The modified code compiled successfully, and I let out a sigh of relief. I was worried Rachel would catch me while I was installing the program on her phone last night, but she had been fast asleep and didn't hear me. She trusted me too much. My phone buzzed with a text message from Steve. Hey neighbor, is it cool if I grab your hedge trimmer later? I couldn't help but think about the fact that he had just been with my wife, and now he was acting as if everything was normal. It's all yours, I reply. Thumbs up emoji. Gotta play the role. The program says it's done. I open it and see Rachel's GPS location. She's on her way to the grocery store. We'll see how long it takes before she makes a detour. I open my drawer and pull out a box. I received it in the mail yesterday. It's filled with small audio recorders. I pick up my phone. It's Jason. You good with the Monday presentation? Want to make sure it's all good before we meet with the client. I could imagine him typing that from his office, maybe even still smelling of the cologne Rachel had bought for him. Ready, I reply, just like last time. Standard protocol. Of course, everything has a protocol. There are steps to follow, and if you follow those steps, you get a certain result. Even when you're planning to betray someone, the clock downstairs rang three times. Rachel would be home any minute now. I closed my laptop and left the tracking software running and decided to place the audio recorders in her office tomorrow during our weekly lunch meeting. She wouldn't notice. I had already taken note of every detail in her office. The front door opened. Ethan, you want to help me with the groceries? Sure. I get up, trying to look as neutral as possible. We got out of the car, and I helped her with the groceries from the trunk. There was a small bruise on her neck. Busy store? I asked casually. Oh, just Saturday stuff, she replies, avoiding my gaze. I do know. Steve was asking about the hedge trimmer, I tell her. There was a brief hesitation, as if she were thinking something over. Oh, that's nice of him. Very thoughtful, I say, bringing bags in. And how's Cheryl? I, uh, haven't really spoken to her. Rachel says, still facing away from me, unloading the groceries. I watch her as she keeps cooking. We should invite them over for dinner sometime. She hesitates as she's about to open a box of pasta. Yeah, maybe. We've all been busy. True, I say, as we put the rest of the things in the fridge. Time flies. Rachel stopped in her tracks and turned around to look at me. Ethan, about the other night. It's all right. I interrupted her gesturing with my hand. Some mysteries are best kept to ourselves, right? She winced at the word secrets, but then quickly covered it up. I just thought we should talk more. Soon, I assure him, plotting the best time to strike. You'll get your answers soon. The GPS tracking app on my laptop just pinged. Rachel's location is now recorded. Day one of monitoring her whereabouts is complete. I'm going to be in the garage for a bit, I say. I have some work to do. All right, she calls back. Dinner at seven? Sounds good. I open the door. And Rachel, I say, that hickey on your neck. You might want to do a better job of covering it up. I shut the door before she can reply, but I hear her gasp as I close it. In the garage, I sit down with my tablet and start looking at the information coming in from the GPS trackers. After a few minutes, I begin to see patterns emerging. It's early still, but I already have a good idea of what I'm going to find when I dig deeper. Three men, eight months, 92 days. Once the sun begins to set, I sit down at my workbench and finish assembling another voice recorder. Some problems needed more creative solutions, and I was always good at coming up with those. I spent the rest of the night analyzing the data and mapping out my next steps. At three in the morning, I went to bed, making sure not to wake Rachel up. I had a hard time falling asleep. After a few hours, the faint light of dawn began to seep into the room. 
I left Rachel in bed. She deserved to sleep in after all the hard work she'd put in yesterday, and started my morning routine. I put the leash on our dog, Max, and took him for a walk. We always went at this time of day on weekends, since it coincided with Cheryl's morning gardening. I checked on Rachel's location and saw that she was still in bed, recovering from her late-night work meeting. We arrived at Cheryl's house, and I saw her kneeling in the dirt, planting some flowers. "'Morning, Cheryl,' I called to her, voice neighborly casual. She stood up and brushed the dirt off her hands. "'Oh, hey, Ethan. Nice morning, isn't it?' "'Great day for yard work,' I say, letting Max wander over to her flower bed for a sniff. I noticed Steve was out early in the car. She frowned a little. "'Yes, he had a client meeting. On a Sunday?' I ask, acting surprised to reinforce the idea. Rachel had mentioned seeing his car at the coffee shop on Maple yesterday as well. Must be swamped at work. Her brow furrowed. The one on Maple? That's all the way across town. Is it? Beats me, I say, as I see her mind racing. Rachel's familiar with the location anyway. Cheryl fidgeted with her gardening gloves. Has she been there before? You'd have to ask her, I say. Though she's been working such late hours lately, I barely see her myself. Cheryl's hand shook a little as she pushed her hair back. Steve's been working a lot of late nights, too. It must be in the air. Must be? I look at my watch. Anyway, we should finish our walk. Max gets cranky if we don't stick to the schedule. Yeah, Cheryl replies, though I can tell she's looking at her house now, trying to see it with new eyes. Ethan, could you... Could you tell me if you notice anything else about Steve's schedule? Of course, neighbor, I say, turning my back to her as I do my best to suppress a grin. What are friends for? We resumed our walk, and I imagined Cheryl standing in her garden as we left her behind. The next morning at work, I took my break and saw that Jason's assistant was in the break room, pouring a cup of coffee. Morning, Emily, I say, grabbing a fresh mug. How was your weekend? Ugh, paperwork, she groans. Jason's been slacking off. That doesn't sound like him, I said, stirring my coffee. I know, and all these secret meetings he has, sometimes I have no idea where he even is. Hmm, I lean against the counter, considering. Rachel said she saw him at lunch last week, but I thought he was in Philadelphia then. Philadelphia? He told me he'd be in client meetings downtown, she said. My bad, I say. I guess I could say the same for Rachel. Her hours have been weird, too, but whatever. The rumors are in full swing by the afternoon. I see Emily talking with other assistants, and they look over at Jason's office, then at Rachel's department. They're already beginning to think something is going on between the two of them. That night, I go home and find Rachel in the kitchen, chopping vegetables for dinner. She had gone to the gym after work for two hours, but according to my tracking app, she had never actually entered the gym. How was work, she says, chopping some vegetables. Eventful, I say. Lots of gossip. The knife stopped. Oh? Apparently Emily's concerned about Jason. He's been acting weird or something. Her shoulders stiffened a little. I didn't. No, you wouldn't, I say. You've been preoccupied, too. He started cutting the onion again, a little faster now. What does that mean? Nothing. I start to exit the kitchen, then add on, Oh, I saw Cheryl this morning. Seems like she's going through something. You should go talk to her. I saw Rachel's face go pale in the reflection of the window. Why would I need to check on Cheryl? Just checking in, I say. That's what friends do, isn't it? The chopping pauses again. I glance over at Cheryl's window and see her talking on the phone. The first cracks are beginning to show. I go upstairs to my study and check the monitors. I can see exactly where Rachel is, and I can see her text messages, emails, and everything else. The unraveling has begun. Her phone buzzes in the kitchen as Cheryl calls her, probably to talk about what Steve just said to her, or what Jason said. They're getting sloppy already, not realizing how fast this is all going to go downhill for them. The clock strikes 8 o'clock. I see Cheryl's shadow through her window. She's pacing back and forth, probably wondering what the hell is going on. I remember the feeling, but at least I didn't have to figure it out all on my own. My phone buzzes in my pocket. I take it out and see a text from Steve. Hey man, weird question, but has Rachel said anything about me to Cheryl? I send him back a message. Not that I know of. Everything okay? Yeah, yeah, just checking. 
I smile to myself and put my phone away. Things are already progressing nicely, and I haven't even done anything yet. I stayed up late that night, watching and waiting. I didn't go to sleep until early in the morning, and even then I didn't stay in bed long. I just wanted to make sure everything was going as planned. By the time I left for work, I'd already delivered an anonymous package to HR, who I knew would be curious enough to open it. Everything was in motion by the time I got to work, and it felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Now, as I stood in the office lounge, seven hours into the workday, I could see the effects of my actions beginning to spread through the building. He was stressed out, talking to the board of directors on the phone in his office. I poured myself a cup of coffee in the break room, and Marcus walked in. Coffee tastes like shit today, I said. Still better than the shitstorm upstairs, he says. Did you hear about these accusations against Jason? I try to look innocent. Oh, just whispers of some missing client funds. And more. Marcus tones down his voice. HR's in meetings right now. They got a delivery. Big one. Anonymous. I put together a package of evidence against him, obtained by going through his computer at work when he wasn't looking. He didn't even password protect it. Shocking if true, I say, watching Jason pace his office. He always seemed so... professional. He let out a derisive snort. Yeah, well, looks can be deceiving. Speaking of which, Rachel seemed a bit upset earlier. I raised my eyebrows. Oh? Yep, just saw her leave his office about an hour ago. She was crying. I took a sip of coffee before answering. Just the stress of the workplace, I guess. The elevator doors opened up, and Emily stepped out. Hey, I have some news. Another issue? Marcus asks. Jason's wife came to reception. Apparently there were some weird hotel charges on their shared credit card. I sipped my coffee, hiding my smile. Oh, how I enjoyed sending that anonymous tip to Mrs. Jason. Poor lady, I say. What a way to find out. I saw her enter his office a few moments later, looking angry. He closed the blinds. Should we do something? Emily asks, hesitantly. No, I say. That's their business. He nodded. Still, hell of a coincidence. All this coming out at once. The truth always comes out, I say, washing out my mug under the tap. Sooner or later. Returning to my desk, I checked the camera feed from the device I'd hidden in Jason's office. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it was clear from their gestures that they were fighting. Rachel was standing in the doorway, looking guilty. A text from Steve suddenly popped up on my phone. Not today. Busy at work. What's up? Problems. Cheryl's asking about Rachel. I waited ten minutes, then replied. Strange. Any idea why? I looked out the window and saw Jason leaving his office. He was heading for the executive bathroom. I counted to sixty and then followed him. He was standing by the sink, splashing water on his face. He looked a little distressed. Hard day at work? I asked, fixing my cufflinks. Jesus, Ethan. Yeah, some misunderstandings. That sounds intense, man. Hope it goes well. He looked at me in the mirror, trying to read my face. I did my best to look like a worried co-worker, as if I had his best interests at heart. Thanks, he says eventually. I'm sure it will. Of course. I turned to go, and then stop. Oh, and Rachel said she might be working late again tonight, by the way, in case you had any plans. He suddenly looked very pale. What did you say? Busy with work stuff, I reply, smiling weakly. I'll see you at the meeting tomorrow, if you actually last that long. I sit back and watch the chaos unfold. Jason is brought into HR for a meeting with our boss. Rachel's manager sits her down for a talk. Emails get sent back and forth between higher-ups, trying to cover their asses. At 5.30, Rachel stops by my cubicle, looking a bit disheveled. Can we talk? I can't right now, I reply, staring at my screen. I have a lot to do. Ethan, come on! It's all going to shit! I looked at her and said, Is it? I hadn't noticed. Do you... do you know something about what's happening? Know what, Rachel? She hears a noise by the elevators and turns to see Jason being led out with a cardboard box in his arms, his wife waiting for him by security, looking like she wants to kill him. Oh, God, Rachel mutters. I think you should talk to your boss, I say, almost casually. I think he's keen to know about any office romances. You didn't. I'm just a systems man, Rachel. Cause and effect. I return my attention to my computer. Best get going. HR stays late on scandal days. Rachel storms off, and I watch her leave with a mixture of satisfaction and regret.
she's going to delete all the evidence of her infidelity. But I don't care. I have everything I need. My phone buzzes again. It's Steve. Cheryl found out about my affair. She's threatening to leave me. What should I do? I text back. I don't know, Steve. Maybe you should ask Rachel. She's good at damage control. Then I put my phone down and turn off my computer. It's time to go home and enjoy the show. I can't wait to see how Rachel will explain all of this to her husband. I'm sure she'll come up with something, but it won't matter. I've already won. Three weeks later, Rachel and I were sitting in Dr. Sullivan's office again. The rain makes a soft rhythmic noise against the windows of Dr. Sullivan's office. Rachel is sitting on the couch across from me, playing the part of my worried wife. And when did you start to feel this way, Ethan? Dr. Sullivan asks, pen poised over her notepad. I guess it's been coming on for a while, I say, sitting back in my chair and trying to sound like someone who's open to therapy. Work has been... stressful. Yeah, we both have demanding jobs, she said. Now these long hours, Dr. Sullivan says, looking at both of us. After considering my words carefully, I said, it feels like we hardly see each other sometimes. Her late nights at work, my projects that need to get done. They're important for work, Rachel blurts out, a little too fast. The rain picks up, pelting against the windows, and Rachel's phone buzzes in her purse. She has it on silent, but not silent enough. I see Dr. Sullivan's eyes turn toward the noise. And how does that make you feel, Rachel? Bad, I guess. I feel like I'm not around enough for him. I had to chuckle at her use of the word guilt. So, communication, Dr. Sullivan begins, scribbling down a note. Ethan, you said that you felt, what was it again? Invalidated, I say, noticing Rachel's reflection twitch slightly at the word. Right, invalidated. Can we talk about that? I leaned forward, trying to put my thoughts into words. It's like you think you know someone, but then you find out they're capable of things you thought they weren't. I noticed Rachel's breathing stop for just a second. Dr. Sullivan didn't see it, but I did. I have to pee, Rachel says, standing up. Be right back. She closed the door, and the room fell silent, apart from the sound of the rain and Dr. Sullivan's pen. You know, I say, choosing my words. Sometimes I think it might be more than just a stressful job. Why do you say that? Little things, behavioral changes, exchanges that seem off. I wave my hand. But it could just be me. Engineers are always looking for patterns, right? Have you talked to Rachel about this? I nodded my head. Would it make a difference if they are real? The sound of a toilet flushing could be heard down the hall. I sat back and tried to look moderately concerned as Rachel came back into the room, her makeup freshly done. Sorry about that, she apologizes, taking a seat and fixing her skirt. Patterns, Dr. Sullivan says. Ethan thinks there's patterns of communication that might be worth exploring. She hesitated for a moment, then smiled. Oh? Like how we talk, but it feels like we're not saying anything, I say, noticing her clutch her purse a little bit harder. Often, Dr. Sullivan cuts in. Partners employ defensive styles of communication when they fear what lies beneath the surface. She didn't know the half of it. I want to be better, Rachel says, with what feels like genuine sincerity. I want us to get through this. The rain keeps falling, keeping track of all the things I'm not saying. That's what we're here for, Dr. Sullivan says with a smile. Now, for your homework, I'd like you each to take a communication journal. I want you to write down when you're feeling connected and disconnected from each other. Good idea, I said. Very, Rachel echoes, likely pondering how to justify her late meetings in the future. See you next week, Dr. Sullivan asks, getting to her feet. We say our goodbyes and our see you tomorrows, and Rachel opens her umbrella with a loud pop. Lunch, she says, struggling to keep up our charade. Can't, I'm meeting with HR about the reorganization. I should probably go there now. Oh, she looks awkward. Is that all good? Should be a good time, I say. Lots going on. She looked nervous. She knew there was an audit coming up. Text me when you're finished, she says. Yeah, I will. I kiss her on the cheek, like I used to. Don't stay at work too long. She watches me as I leave, her face growing smaller in the reflection of the rain-slicked glass. I look at her in my rearview mirror and see her pulling out her phone, 
probably calling Jason to warn him about HR. That's fine. All of this is part of the plan. I know exactly how to play these people, and I know how they'll react. They're like rats in a maze, and I'm the scientist observing from above. The rain continued as I drove back to work, preparing for the next domino to fall. I knew there was a chance Rachel would know what I was up to, but I didn't think it was likely. And even if she did, I was prepared for that too. The afternoon rain turned to evening sunshine, and before I knew it the day had passed and it was time to go home for dinner. I drove home to the last few rays of sunlight disappearing behind the horizon, knowing Rachel would already be preparing dinner. She always wanted everything to be perfect, especially for occasions like this. By the time I arrived, the house was spotless and the table was set. Everything was as it should be, except for a few small details. The rain has stopped and the sky is clear now. Our dining room is dimly lit with candles on the table, wine glasses filled in front of each of us. My wife has set the table beautifully, as usual. Steve and Cheryl are across from us, Jason and his wife Amanda at the other ends. Amanda, you've got to get the recipe for the salmon, Rachel says. It's so good. Of course, but I have to warn you, I'm not a very good cook, Rachel said. My boyfriend had told me that before, but he hadn't mentioned it to Rachel, apparently, and the room went silent for a minute while he took a sip of wine. How would Jason know what I like to cook? Cheryl asks, sounding a bit more suspicious now. Maybe from all those late meetings, I replied, taking a sip of wine. Working overtime can do that to you. Rachel's knife scratched loudly against her plate. Anyway, I was thinking about that overtime, Steve cuts in, a little too eagerly. How's that new project treating you, Ethan? Oh, it's really interesting, I say, leaning back in my chair, taking a sip of wine. Pattern recognition. You can learn a lot from noticing patterns. Jason cleared his throat and took a sip of his water. Patterns? Amanda asks, genuinely curious. She's a data analyst, so I guess that makes sense. Yeah, patterns, you know. People are creatures of habit. They might go to the same places, do the same things. Like, uh, the coffee shop on Maple Street. Rachel dropped her fork on her plate and Cheryl looked up. Interesting question, I say casually. You know, there are some commonalities in affairs. The word affairs catches Amanda's attention. She stops eating, looking at her husband. What a strange thing to bring up over dinner, Rachel says, forcing a smile. I'm just trying to make conversation, I say. Steve, weren't you saying something about those real estate trends? Hotels that have repeat business customers? Steve looked as if he'd seen a ghost. Cheryl was white-knuckling her glass of wine. I don't remember, Steve says uncomfortably. Guess I must be thinking of somebody else. I look at Amanda. You guys still doing those corporate rate specials down at the Marriott? Jason knocked over his glass of wine, spilling a crimson stain across the tablecloth. Oh no, Rachel says, standing up and reaching for napkins. I'll just... Have a seat, Rachel. I say softly. I'm sure Jason will be able to clean up his own spills. He's used to it. The room went silent. Maybe we should leave, Amanda says in a tone that's both soft and firm. But why? I say, pointing at the food. We haven't even finished eating yet. Rachel spent all day making us dessert. Tiramisu. Isn't it your favorite, Steve? She looks over at him, surprised. How do you know what kind of pie he likes? I... We've had it at block parties, Steve blurts out. The block party last July, I ask, feigning innocence, when I was at that conference in Seattle. Rachel suddenly stood up. Who wants coffee? Funny you say that. Wasn't that the same night you had that meeting with the client, Steve, and Rachel was working late? The temperature in the room suddenly gets ice cold. I can see Amanda putting two and two together, and Cheryl begins to look horrified. Ethan, please, Rachel says. Please what, dear? I'm just trying to make conversation. Isn't that what these dinner parties are about? Sharing stories? Learning the truth? We should go, Jason said. Where are you going, Jason? You ran off last time when HR came looking for you, didn't you? What HR questions? Amanda asked, looking offended. The clock struck nine. Rachel sat back down in her chair, looking defeated. Oh, you haven't heard? I flash a friendly smile. It's a pretty good story. Really illustrates those patterns I was mentioning. Hotels, late meetings missing expense reports. Just stop. Steve replies weakly. Why? Don't friends deserve the truth? I lift my glass. To friendship. 
and to patterns that always inevitably show themselves. Cheryl got up, crying. I want to go home, she said. We didn't even get to the best part yet, I say, a bit playfully. Rachel, why don't you share with the group what's inside your personal projects folder? Both Rachel and Steve go pale. Jason looks like he's going to vomit. What is in the folder, Rachel? Amanda asks, with the laser focus of an analyst. Rachel tried to say something, but no words came out of her mouth. Maybe we'll have everyone over for dinner again, I say, getting up and collecting dishes. Once they've all worked through it, processed their own loops. The departure of everyone is chaotic but silent. Accusations have been made and people are leaving, with slamming doors and hasty goodbyes. Rachel sits there, looking at the red wine spilled over her tablecloth. Why? she asks at last. I started putting the dirty dishes in the dishwasher, trying to keep my hands busy. Why what? Why tell them? Why let them destroy each other? Why do it tonight? Any of it. All of it. Because patterns need to be recognized, I say simply. And systems need to be debugged. I see three more cars leave from the front window as the grandfather clock continues to tick away. The truth is out there now, and it's not going back in the bottle. I'll do the cleanup, Rachel says softly. Don't worry about it. I have a lot of experience cleaning these days. I shut the dishwasher. Some things just can't be cleaned up, though, can they? She is crying now, but I can't tell if it's genuine or just another of her routines. Either way, I have done what I came here to do. I know that the fire I started will keep burning long after this day is over. By the time I get back home, it will already have spread to other families in the neighborhood. I don't need to worry about that. It was a cold autumn night when we went home after the dinner party. The next day, it was almost as if nothing had happened. But if you looked closely, you could see that the trust between us had begun to corrode. A few more days passed, and I started to work overtime. Rachel wasn't home as much as usual either. She had meetings for her charity organization, and she also went out with her friends more often than before. We didn't talk about what had happened at the dinner party, but we both knew that things had started to change. The days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months. We were living in a slow-motion car crash, and we both knew it. We just didn't know how to stop it. And then, before I knew it, our anniversary arrived. The days since the dinner party are a countdown to tonight. Our 15th anniversary. 5,475 days of marriage and 1,368 days of lies. We have dinner at Le Petit Jardin. Rachel is wearing a new dress. Or maybe it's just an old one that's loose on her since she lost weight. I have a present for her, but it's not wrapped in silver paper. Your regular Mr. Forrester, Pierre says. He grabs menus. Yes. Rachel follows him, her heels clacking like little rat feet. The wine list, monsieur? Pierre offers up the leather-bound menu with a flourish. The Bordeaux from last year, Rachel says. You loved it. I look at her. On second thought, I think I'll have the Chateau Margaux, 1982. She raises her eyebrows. That's expensive. Special day, I just say. Deserves it. The wine was brought out in a crystal decanter, and Rachel began to talk about her job, she had just gotten a new position after the reorganization, and she deliberately avoided talking about Jason not being there and about Steve putting his house up for sale. The foie gras sounds delicious, she says, her menu shaking in her hand, but I really shouldn't. You look thinner, I say, sipping my wine. Is it stress? She winced. It's been a little crazy. Yes, I sip the wine. How's Cheryl? I don't know. Rachel puts her fork down. You know I haven't talked to her since... The dinner party, I say. That was a real learning experience, huh? A waiter appeared just then, saving her from having to answer. We ordered. She picked something light, and I picked something that was unnecessarily expensive. Fifteen years, Rachel says quietly, when we are alone again. That's like... A lifetime, I ask? Or ninety-two days, eight months, whatever you want to call it. She looked pale. Can we just have one nice evening? Well, I plan to enjoy myself tonight. I pull something out of my jacket pocket. And I brought you a gift. She took the envelope. What's this? Go ahead. Happy anniversary. The restaurant was bustling and full of people, none of them knowing that Rachel's life was about to be turned upside down any moment.
She opened the envelope and pulled out the first picture. It showed her and Jason standing outside the Marriott Hotel. The next picture was a receipt from that same hotel, with a date and time displayed prominently for all to see. That's not all, I say. There's a lot more. Bank records, text messages, that little video from Steve's phone. Stop, she says. Please stop. Why? You didn't? Our main courses came. The waiter noticed Rachel's tears and asked if everything was all right. Is everything okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, I say. My wife's just a little emotional. Anniversaries and all that jazz. I can't eat right now, Rachel said on the verge of tears. How long have you known? No, I knew. Or I had a very good idea. But those are two separate questions, and I knew at two separate times. I sliced another piece of steak and chewed it slowly. The message I first saw was an accident. The rest were a study. The work dinner, she says. The HR reckoning. Steve's marriage. You were behind all of it? I told people things. What they did with that information was up to them. She reached for her glass of wine with trembling hands. What do you want from me? Want? I chew on the deliciously prepared meat. I want what anyone wants. Things that make sense. Things that work. Things that have meaning. I'm sorry, she says. I wasn't trying to... Get busted? I ask. That's true of most glitches. There's a couple at the next table celebrating something, an engagement maybe, enjoying themselves in stark contrast to our purposeful ruination. There's papers in there too, I go on. Very detailed, very reasonable. My lawyer says they're ironclad. Tears streaked her makeup. Divorce papers? On our anniversary? A little poetic, don't you think? Fifteen years to create, three months to obliterate. Granted, you did start the obliterating process a touch early. Well, we can always try therapy again, she suggests. I'm open to it. Therapy's something you do before the life is sucked out of you. I wave the check over. You're welcome to keep the house. Not the grandfather clock, though. It's coming with me. It's the only thing in the house that never lied to me. The waiter came by with our check, and I signed for it with a hefty tip, still pretending not to notice Rachel crying. When? she asks as I get to my feet. Tomorrow. The movers will take your stuff to your sister's. I pull my coat on. I'd say it's been nice knowing you, but I think this partnership has had enough dishonesty. I leave her there, sitting in the mess she created, the two glasses of wine still standing on the table, untouched. I watch her rest her face in her hands and cry as I get into my car. It will be twelve o'clock soon. Fifteen years. Hopefully, it will take fifteen years until she will be able to find me again. But for now, I'm feeling strangely calm as I drive back to what will soon be my new home. I drive around the block a few times before I decide to park the car. I want to make sure I won't be interrupted. Just as I pull up in front of the house, my phone vibrates in my pocket. I take it out. It's 11.47 p.m., 13 minutes until my scheduled breakdown. I take a deep breath, close my eyes for a few seconds, and look at the screen. I close the restaurant door behind me, leaving Rachel as she sat there crying in the middle of the restaurant, and the maitre d' looking at her with a worried expression. I could see her through the window, breaking down as she realized I'd been right about everything. My phone rang, and I picked it up. Good to go? I ask, shivering from the cold. All the appropriate parties have received the documents. Steve's lawyer's gonna have a heart attack. And the funds? Locked down as of midnight. Rachel won't be able to use her credit cards in the morning. I nodded, even though he couldn't see it. Perfect. I started walking down the narrow street, my footsteps echoing in the night. Behind me, I heard Rachel calling my name. Ethan, come back, Ethan! I don't turn around. Her high heels are clicking faster now, and I can tell she's struggling to keep up. You have no right to— I still stopped when I heard her trip, but I didn't look back. Your sister's waiting for you, I tell the dark road. I'd get an Uber. Your cards should be functional for a few more hours. You wouldn't do this, she says. Not this kind of malice. Finally, I do turn around, showing her a smile. Isn't it? You never really knew me, Rachel. Too busy knowing others. A group of drunken people walk in between us, momentarily breaking our frozen scene. And the Charity Foundation? Our collaborations? Reallocated. Rebranded. They'll operate better, like everything else, without tainted goods. Her phone buzzes again. Probably another text from Jason or Steve trying to figure out why they're all going nuts at the same time. 
You really did think of everything, she says. That's what engineers are good for. We solve problems. A cop car drove past, lighting up Rachel's tears in red and blue, and the officer looked over at us as if to see if there was a domestic dispute happening. Go home, Rachel. Back to your sisters, I clarify. The movers will inform you of when you can enter. I continue walking, leaving her in the darkness behind me, my footsteps ringing in my ears as I carry on down the street. A few minutes later, my phone rang again. It was Amanda. They bought it. Emergency meeting, first thing in the morning. Happy hunting, I say, grateful for her shrewdness. I walk along the sidewalk, my breath visible in the cold night air. Looking at my reflection in the windows of the stores as I pass, I see a man who is no longer half of a broken marriage, a man who is now free to do what he wishes. And for the first time in a long time, I'm excited by that prospect. Arriving at home, I go inside, hearing the bells of the grandfather clock chiming as I come in. I glance at my watch and see it's exactly 11.30 p.m., just as I expected. I take off my shoes and coat and go into the kitchen. Now that my wife is gone, the place already feels like it's mine. I pour myself a scotch and go into my office, where I keep my computer. On the screen, I have several browser windows open, tracking the progress of my plan. A text pops up on my phone, and I see it's from Cheryl. Thank you for telling me the truth, it says. I don't respond. There's no need to. I look back at my computer screen and see a live feed from a camera that shows Rachel getting out of an Uber at her sister's house. Another window shows Steve's lawyer working late into the night. Another shows Jason's office being packed up into boxes by security staff. A smile spreads across my face as I sip my scotch. It all worked out perfectly, just as I had hoped. The bells of the grandfather clock chime midnight and I finish my drink. The house is quiet and I take a moment to enjoy the stillness. It's like a puzzle that's finally been put together, all the pieces fitting perfectly in their proper places. Tomorrow I'll call a lawyer to get the divorce proceedings started, but for now, I'll just enjoy this moment of peace, and the knowledge that everything is finally as it should be. I cared about you. I did. I close the message. Some variables are better left unknown. The sun rises over the city. I haven't slept. I've been sitting in my study, looking out the window at the lights of downtown, pondering the words of Rachel's last message. But now the sun is coming up, and with it comes the resolution of the first of many consequences. And I'm ready for it. I woke up the next morning and watched in horror as everything began to unravel. The news of our anniversary dinner had spread like wildfire, and it quickly began to seep into every aspect of our lives. Cheryl sent me a text message. Yeah, I'll handle it. I say back, grateful for how quickly things can turn around when truth is on your side. Just then, the doorbell rings. It's right on time. Ethan, I had to come over. She's holding her purse in front of her as a sort of barrier. We are all so heartbroken by all of this. I motioned for her to come into the living room and noticed she was looking around, seeing the places where Rachel's things used to be. Coffee? I ask, playing the part of injured but proud husband. Oh no, I won't be long. She sits at the end of the couch. We just wanted to let you know that Rachel has been relieved of her duties on the planning committee in light of recent events. I decided to leave it at that. Good call, I said. And of course, you'll still run the summer fundraiser. Her voice has that certain edge, the kind of passive aggression only a mother can muster. We need consistency. Just as she said this, the grandfather clock struck ten. Yeah, I say. Somebody needs to uphold our dignity. Sarah's phone buzzed. More people in the neighborhood were talking, I thought. I saw Rachel's name on the screen before Sarah turned it off. Such a shock, she says. Though in retrospect, it makes sense. I guess that's usually how it goes. Just then, my phone buzzed. Rachel had tried to take money out of our shared account and failed. Sarah saw the notification on my phone and looked at me, pretending to be sympathetic. If you need anything... Say, I think Cheryl could use a friend at book club tonight. Steve's been... tough. She beams at the opportunity for new information. Of course, we'll be there. After she leaves, I turn my attention to the surveillance again. Rachel is trying and failing to pay for things, send emails, and contact friends. One after another, she's being blocked out of her life. My work phone rings. It's my replacement at work. Ethan, 
those files for the project you wanted to see. Pretty neat, huh? I say, already knowing the answer. The board made the right call. Are you coming to the emergency partners meeting? Absolutely. The morning turned to afternoon. Rachel's sister called a couple more times. I let it go to voicemail, just in case I needed the recording for a possible lawsuit. The doorbell rang again. It was the husband of Rachel's former tennis partner. I heard about what happened, he says, standing on the porch a little awkwardly. Anyway, Karen and I have decided to withdraw from the couple's league. Feels like the right thing to do. I nodded. I hate awkward situations. Yeah. Okay. We're still on for golf Sunday? Yeah. I had several of these conversations before the day was over. Seventeen of them, according to my phone. Each of them further isolating Rachel from her previous life, alienating her from those who might help her. At six o'clock I got ready to leave for book club. As I was putting my coat on, I got a text from Rachel. They're leaving me. This isn't fair. It's a sick way to get back at me. I read it, and then respond. Not revenge. System correction. I grab the bottle of wine for book club and lock the door on my way out. Looking over at Steve's house, I see Cheryl chatting with Sarah through the window, right on schedule. One more message from the lawyer confirming everything will be ready for tomorrow, just as I planned. I walk to book club, leaving my phone on silent so I won't be disturbed by any more interruptions. The grandfather clock ticks in the background as I take another day away from Rachel. Another day of her life, another day of him. I arrive at book club and greet everyone. Cheryl is there, smiling and laughing with the other women. It looks like she's fitting in nicely, just as I planned. We discuss the book and drink wine. I talk about Rachel a bit, and the women offer their condolences. I tell them I heard she's doing well and leave it at that. When I get home, I fall asleep easily. It's a good night's sleep and I wake up feeling refreshed. There's a lot to do today. I can't wait to get started. The sun is shining in through my office windows, illuminating the freshly signed divorce papers on my desk. Rachel's signature is a little smaller than it used to be, I notice. My phone pings with a message from Marcus. Coming, I say, picking up my briefcase. At nine o'clock in the evening, I lock the front door to the office. The only car left in the parking lot was my own. Cheryl's car wasn't next door, but I didn't think that much about it. Maybe she was meeting her lawyer. Steve's house had a sold sign in front of it. My phone rang. It was Rachel's sister. Ethan, she's not eating. Are you sure we need to be doing this? I let it go to voicemail, as I did with the rest. I have a feeling it wasn't entirely necessary. When I stepped out of the elevator, everything felt different, cleaner, less buggy. Jason's office was empty, and his name had been scraped off his door. Morning, Ethan, Emily says, as if everything is normal. No reference to the fact that her boss was fired. Your 9.30 is in the conference room. Great. Coffee? Ready to go. I recognize some of the faces in the room. Amanda is seated near the head of the table. I remember she and Jason knew each other. They had dated. Ready to start? She says, sounding devoid of any personal investment in the conversation. Numbers first, I say, pulling out my laptop. Then we can talk about the reorganization. The meeting goes on, and I look out through the glass windows, seeing everything slowly return to normal. In fact, I see the productivity is already higher than it was just a few days ago. I get another text from Rachel, but I swipe it away. I don't even bother to read it. It's better this way. Sometimes you can't fix the bugs. Sometimes you have to get rid of them completely. When the workday is over, I go home. It's strange. Everything is so quiet now. But I guess I just have to get used to it. I suppose it's a small price to pay for not having to live with a cheater. I look at my phone and see that I have one final message from Rachel. I don't know how you did it. How you could be so specific with your malice, but I guess I didn't know you at all. I read it over, satisfied with the result. Rachel wouldn't have gotten it before, but now she would. Looking out the window, I watched the city below. Rachel was out there somewhere, living in her sister's spare bedroom. Steve was in a bachelor apartment, learning how to live as a single man. Jason was looking for work, trying to find a job in his field after being blacklisted. And here I was, alone in the house, the only one who was telling the truth. I listened to the grandfather clock chiming midnight, echoing through the empty house. No more messages came through on my phone. And I knew there wouldn't be any more either. Everything was working exactly as it should. Each part of the plan had been carried out to perfection. 
and now all that was left to do was sit back and enjoy the peace and quiet. Pouring myself a glass of scotch, I sat in front of the window and stared out at the dark, quiet city. I raised a glass to my reflection in the glass and toasted myself. It had all gone exactly according to plan. 